session. Uh, so um, I'll remind you, we introduced this uh, notion of bounded co-cycles, bounded cohomology. And here is the definition for the homogeneous uh, situation. You consider this chain complex here. And here's your co-boundary map where you just uh, you know, take alternating sums and then you forget one entry. Uh, and then the bounded cohomology uh, is exactly the kernel of, um, of one map uh, quotient by the image of the other. I'll just maybe uh, do a quick remark, and that is, uh, so of course, really, you know, when we're studying this space, we really are mainly interested if it's non-zero or if it's zero. Uh, but I'll just put a little remark that, uh, so this space, as we've defined it, uh, is a pseudo Banach space because B is a Banach space. And so the kernel, the L infinity functions here, this is a Banach space. So the kernel here is a Banach space. And the uh, image is not a closed subspace. So the quotient is not a Banach space. Um, but uh, the quotient still has a, uh, a uh, an function on it, which satisfies all the axioms of being a norm except for you could give norm zero to something non-zero. So this is called a pseudo norm. And, uh, but you still have the completeness uh, condition here. So this is called a pseudo Banach space. It's uh, like a Banach space, but uh, you don't require that the, the norm distinguishes points. But you do require completeness. All right, so that's just a remark. But like I said, we're mostly gonna be interested in is it the zero space or is it the non-zero space? So just as a vector space is how uh, you usually care about this. All right, so this is the homogeneous chain complex. And, uh, and I remarked that this is uh, for when we consider the left action of the group on itself, then this is naturally isomorphic to the usual chain complex that I defined earlier last lecture. And here's the way you map back and forth from one to the other. So these are very explicit uh, formulas here, and you can just go ahead and, and check that. Um, uh, and then check that they're compatible so that they give you the same cohomology. Uh, so I won't do that because it's a very straightforward calculation, not particularly interesting. All right, so, and I said today that we'll, we'll prove that uh, the uh, bounded two cohomology of a free group with values in its left regular representation is non-trivial. Uh, to do that, first, let me sh show you a proof that bounded two cohomology with the trivial coefficients here is also non-trivial. So this is a result of Brooks from, I believe, the uh, 1978. I did copy it down. So this is this is a theorem of Brooks from 78. Although actually, I believe this might have already been known by uh, Johnson uh, even earlier, but uh, this is at least an explicit construction. So maybe I shouldn't write it as a theorem because I think it might have been known by Johnson earlier. I can't remember, but uh, let me give it as an example because these are specific co-cycles well, which we're gonna care about. And so what we do is the following, we fix a word uh, so W uh, in a free group on two generators. And uh, I want, uh, let me go ahead and assume that the length of the word is at least um, three. So let's assume that the length of this word is uh, greater than or equal to three. All right, so this is a reduced word so that it represents an element of the free group uh, with the length, length at least three. Uh, so then what can we do? We're gonna define this uh, quasi cycle. So we define Q of some element T to be uh, the following. So this is, we first look at the uh, number. So we write T in reduced form. And then we look at the number of substrings uh, which give us W. So this is the number of substrings of T 
that uh, equals w. So the number, I should say, the number of times w occurs as a substring of t, number of times w occurs as a substring of t. And then we subtract the number of times uh, w occurs as a substring of t inverse. T inverse. Uh, so one thing you can see is, is this function is uh, pretty clearly unbounded. Uh, so you could just take, well, you maybe don't want to take w to the end because maybe there's some cancellation between the end of the string of w and the beginning. Uh, but you could certainly take uh, w and patch on some element here. So some, you know, uh, w not, and then take this to the n, and then you can get this so that the w naught, you get lots of w's here and there's no cancellation with the w naught on the left and the right. And also you can do this in a way that you don't introduce a copy of w inverse uh, in the string. And so in this, you can construct this so you see that this explicitly goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. So this function is pretty easy to see that it gives you an unbounded uh, function. Uh, for instance, you might even consider just the element uh, maybe like a b w is equal to a b a b in which case here uh, you can just take q of w n itself and you see you get many many copies of a b a b uh, in fact here it'll you know quite easy to see that this goes to infinity as in the all right, so this function, uh, so here's an explicit example, but you can do this for any word, see that there's some sequence which goes to infinity. Uh, so this is an unbounded uh, function. And one, I claim- One, one uh, question, in, in that example, Q of WN is not equal to N, right? It's equal to- No, I guess Q of, of W squared would be three, uh, Q, I guess it'll be two N minus one in this case. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in this, yeah, explicitly this is 2n minus 1. Okay, so uh, what we have here is a, it's an unbounded function, and then I claim that this is a quasi-cocycle. So this is a quasi-cocycle. So i.e. that is a bounded distance away from a co-cycle. So to see that, uh, we just need to compute uh, q of uh, s minus q of uh, st minus q of t. We're taking the trivial action here. So quasi co-cycle is a quasi, quasi morphism are usually what they're called here. When we have the trivial action, usually quasi-cocycles are called quasi-morphisms. And then let's think, what is this, uh, what's going on here? And, and what happens is, maybe we can draw it with a graph here. Here's the free group. So here's the free group. And then we take some element S here and uh, let's draw the graph, the, right, here's the word from the origin to S. And so we look at this word and we count up the number of times W is, is obtained there. Uh, so like maybe W, uh, if W were like uh, something like AB, then we see that this, we look at uh, that, you know, this graph gives us, there's AB right there. So this is E and this is AB. Uh, so we see that we look at the number of times you go horizontally to the right and then vertically to the, to the top. So every time you have some shape like that, you count one. And every time you go down and then to the left, you count negative one. So for this particular S here that I've drawn, it looks like it would be one. And then you have some uh, 
some other uh, ST out here. Uh, so here you have some ST, and then you do the same thing uh, there. So you look at this. this graph something like there and then you also have t but of course the shape of t uh, is going to be the same as the shape of going from s to st so we also have you know, this and for for s we'll count it this way to get to we'll look all the all the directions of w when we transverse it from e to s and from T, we go from S to T, and we also go forward in that direction. So this is as we go along T. And then from ST, uh, here we have, oh, I see that I wrote this wrong. So we have negative for the ST, so that means we go the other way. Um, so it's like we travel along this path here. This is a triangle in the tree. And every time we see a W, we add one. And every time we see a W, inverse, we subtract one. And then you see what's going to happen is that uh, when you do this, you get this triangle. So you're going to get here E, you're going to get some uh, S, and then you're going to get some uh, ST. So since it's a tree, you get this triangle, which is just a tripod. And whenever you have a copy of W that's somewhere like this, you see that it contributes positive from one side and negative on the other. Right, so then you have there, when you go this direction, you subtract. And so they cancel out. And the only time where you don't get cancellation is if the W crosses this triple point. When you cross this triple point, then as you go from E to S, you might add W, but you never subtract it because you, you go this way and then go this way. So you don't subtract it away. So in this case, we can see what is the difference between these numbers here it's going to be exactly the number of times that you have a W uh, along this, along this side. So this is going to be bounded, at least, you know, there are three ways you can do this, and there's W and W inverse, so this is going to be bounded by the, um, I guess, six, so this is less than or equal to six, and then you're going to have the length of W, uh, because the triple point has to hit W somewhere in the middle of it, so you have the length of W minus one. So this is the length of W minus one. So we get this inequality for the quasi cycle here. Um, so in particular, you see that this is bounded uh, independently of S and T. So this cocycle, this cocycle depends on W, so it is a quasi cycle is what I mean to say. So therefore Q which depends on W, of course, so you get one of these for each W, and it is a quasi cycle. All right, but now I claim uh, that this is uh, at least not a bounded difference away, a distance away from a genuine cycle. So how can we see that? Well, let me give you uh, maybe another explicit example. So how about we'll take the same W here that we were given before. So W will equal AB, AB. So then the claim is that uh, QW is not a bounded distance away from a genuine cocycle, or in this case, it's a homomorphism from a homomorphism. Right, and why is that the case? Uh, if it were, if not, so let's say we have some uh, theta mapping F2 to the real line, uh, a homomorphism, such that QW uh, of T minus theta of T is always bounded by some constant k. Well, then, can what we what can we say about this? 
Well, for this particular example, uh, you, we can see right away, we can compute it on powers of A and we can compute it on powers of B. And, and when we do that, they never contain a word W. So note, uh, I'll have to go on the next page here. So note, again, for W equal A, B, A, B. So then Q, W of any power of A is the same as QW of any power of B, which is zero, right? And never contains a W string of W or its inverse. Uh, so therefore, what do you get is that since this map theta here is a bounded distance away from Q, and since Q is zero on A and B, we get that therefore theta of A N an absolute value is, and also theta of Bn, an absolute value is less than or equal to k. But theta is a homomorphism. So if you have a homomorphism into the reals that's bounded, then it's zero. So we get that therefore theta of A is equal to theta of B is equal to zero. But of course, A and B generate the free group, which implies theta is equal to zero. And so therefore, this would imply that Q is bounded, QW is bounded, which we already argued that is definitely not. Uh, so the conclusion you get is that therefore, this QW, for here's an explicit QW, uh, is, uh, represents a non-trivial uh, class in the space of quasi cocycles, uh, quasi cocycles modulo uh, bound functions, which are bounded distance away from genuine cocycles uh, of gamma into, in this case, it's the trivial, which I mentioned before. We saw last time this was uh, canonically isomorphic to, uh, well, we didn't show it was isomorphic. For free groups, it's isomorphic, but we showed at least that it embeds canonically into um, gamma uh, taking values, in this case, the trivial representation, right? So therefore, as a consequence of this, you get in particular H2 bounded F2 with coefficients in the reals is non-zero. Non in fact, you can, by taking different words, you can see pretty easily that this is in fact in an infinite dimensional uh, space. All right, so like I said, this was, you know, this was, I think, originally due to Johnson, but Brooks gave this uh, fairly simple uh, constructive proof of this. Uh, actually, there's a generalization. So, um, yeah, maybe before I do that, let me remark that, so this is from the inhomogeneous perspective of quasi cocycles. From the homogeneous perspective, what is going on? Um, so, well, again, if W in a free group or W is a reduced word. Um, again, I'll assume that the length of W is greater than or equal to three. Um, so then what do we have? We have that uh, we consider the map, I'll call it C, uh, so it depends on W. And so this is mapping F2 squared to L2 of uh, edges. Uh, so L2 of, uh, I guess it's F2 times F2, but I'll think of these as uh, edges of length W, right? So these are not, they aren't edges, but they're paths of length W, geodesics of length W, right? So where E W, a set of geodesics of length 
w. Um, and what's going on here? So how, are, how do you define this? Uh, this is given by C w of uh, S t. This is equal to the, uh, this is equal, going to be equal to the set of geodesics that lie, uh, the set of geodesics that uh, are translates of W and they lie on the path from S to, S to T. So this is going to be, uh, we're gonna look at the, so this is going to be, sorry, this is not in L infinity, but this is not in L2, but in L infinity. Uh, and how we're gonna define this. So this is, this times a geodesic is going to be uh, one if uh, gamma uh, is a translate of W and lies on um, the path from S to T. So I'll write that and gamma is contained in the path from S to T. So there's a unique geodesic from S to T. And so if gamma is a sub geodesic, a sub path of this geodesic, and if it's a translate of W, a group translate of W, then I'll put a one there. And here I mean orientation preserving when I write this inclusion here. And we'll say negative one, if again, if gamma is a translate of W and uh, say gamma is contained in the geodesic from T to S, so in reverse, and it will be zero otherwise. All right, so this defines a function, a bounded function on, on the space of geodesics of length W and what can we do then? So this is again a map from uh, F2 squared. So the notice, notice that this is equivariant. Uh, so this is uh, F2, so gamma is here is F2 equivariant. Why is that? That's because we took all translates of W. So therefore if you, um, if you act diagonally on ST, you just shift the path and then that just uh, translates uh, which ones you include here. So this is a gamma equivariant map. And then we look at the boundary of this. So let me remind you what this is explicitly. So at RST, this is CWST minus CWRT plus C, W, um, R, S. So what do we have here? Well, again, let me draw a picture. So this is certainly uh, equivariant and it's certainly a co-cycle because it's the co-boundary operator applied to this co-cycle. And what's going on here is that, that if you have some say R, S and T here, then again, you, uh, so here from S to T, you collect all the copies. So you travel from S to T and you collect all the copies of translates of W that you see. And then you, um, uh, and then you collect the negative of the ones from T to S. So if you think of this as we're traveling in this direction, and we count every time we see a W, we, we count that as a characteristic function here. And then when we go to T to, uh, well, here's R to T, but we do it in reverse. So we're going from T to R. So we go up here to R. So again, traveling in this direction. And then here's R to S, so we go in this direction. So again, we have this uh, triangle here, this tripod, and we translate around this. So we move along this path of this tripod and wherever we see a translate of W, 
um, then we uh, mark that characteristic function. And if we see a translate of W inverse, then we mark that characteristic function with a negative, and then we sum up what we need. And so the observation is that the same thing for Brooks, so this now, uh, yeah, so the same argument that we gave for the Brooks co-cycle, we see that in fact this, so let me call this alpha sub W. Uh, so we see that here alpha sub W of R, S, and T, uh, what are the only things that contribute to this? Well, again, it's only the copies of W that cross the triple point. So if we have some translate of W that crosses the triple point, then it's going to be picked up from going along one of the paths, but not the other. So we again see that this is going to be less than or equal to, and this is the L1 norm here. So this is less than or equal to six times uh, the length of W minus one. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let me also maybe recall that uh, maybe a, we don't actually need that the length of W is greater than or equal to three, just um, greater than or equal to one. This all makes perfect sense. Uh, you can still define this and you still get this inequality. And this is something we've seen before earlier in the semester that if we just take a single uh, letter, then what are we doing? This is exactly putting a structure of a space with walls on the graph. So if we have a single edge, so if, if W is equal to A, then what we're doing is we're cutting, we can think of cutting this off at each of the uh, horizontal copies, copies of A, and this puts a wall structure on our tree. And we saw before that for wall structures, you get a genuine co-cycle into L2. And that's exactly what this is saying, L1 here or L2, when the length of W is equal to one, you get the zero here, which is just saying that it's a genuine cocycle. So that's just a remark. But here we're going to be interested in when length of W is, is two or, or actually three or higher is what we'll work with. Um, and so in this case, we don't get a cocycle, but we get a, a quasi cocycle in this case. So it's it's a bounded, a bounded cocycle. So here's the bound and maps into L1. So this this gives us a map. So therefore, alpha w maps gamma uh, cubed. So gamma here's the free group into L1 of the space of geodesics, and this is a bounded cocycle. So which we see is really very closely connected to the Brooks cocycle. In fact, how you get the Brooks co-cycle is the Brooks co-cycle, you compose this with just adding up the coefficients. So notice the Brooks co-cycle. Is just the composition. from uh, alpha one, so you have alpha sub w, this maps gamma cubed to L1 of the space of edges of length, or space of geodesics of length w. And then there's a natural gamma equivariant map here to the reals, which is just sum the coefficients. So, And when you do here, so then rather than get a characteristic function here, so then we don't get a function, we don't get a function in L1, we get a function in the reals, and exactly just counts the number of times you see a word minus the number of times you see its inverse. So this is exactly the Brooks co-cycle that we saw. So this is a generalization of the Brooks co-cycle. Um, and this was uh, first, at least the first place I saw this was in a paper by um, Bestvina, Bromberg, and Fujiwara from, uh, I want to say maybe 2014, maybe 2015, some, somewhere around there. Uh, so this is fairly, fairly recent. Um, 
And so you can generalize this Brooks co-cycle so that you actually get this co-cycle into this L1 space here. And then, so it's natural. So what you can do here is, of course, you don't just get a function L1. So whenever you have any sort of equivariant map here, you get a co-cycle. And so then you can consider, like for instance, and you can consider L1 inside of L2, which is what we're going to be interested here in. And, uh, and so then you can ask, well, can you extend Brooks' technique uh, to show that it's still non-trivial? So this is the Brooks co-cycle. We know that when we go to the reals, it's a bounded, it's not a bounded distance away from a co-cycle. But if you go to other spaces, maybe it is a bounded distance away from co-cycle. It's, it's unclear. So you have to check this. And they've, they've developed a very general argument that shows that in fact, if you find a, if you compose this with a map into any uniformly convex monarch space, you can show that this is non-trivial. And I'll just do a special case of this into L2. Right, so here's the result I want to present next. Um, this is again due to Bestvina, Bromberg, and Fujiwara uh, from, I believe it's 14, maybe it's 2015. And that is that, uh, so if the length of W is greater than or equal to three, so then uh, alpha W, thinking of this as a mapping from the free group uh, F3 to, uh, in this case, we're going to map to L2. Uh, just by the natural embedding of L1 into L2, uh, then this is a uh, non-trivial uh, boundary cycle. So that's the proof uh, that I want to now present. Uh, so notice, of course, it's still bounded just because the L2 norm is less than or equal to the L1 norm. And we already know it's a bounded co-cycle into L1. Uh, so this is still a bounded uh, co-cycle. And we just need to show that it's not a bounded distance away from a quasi-co-cycle. So to do this, again, we're going to, so this, so the reason I mentioned this, and that was maybe the other observation I wanted to make here uh, before I launch in on this uh, theorem, is that I presented this in the uh, homogeneous situation. And the reason I did that is because of the following. So note that this alpha sub w uh, extends uh, continuously to a separately continuous, continuous uh, bounded co-cycle, which I'll still denote by alpha, alpha sub w, uh, but we can map it to the completion uh, gamma three to one. So that's the remark I want to make, is that um, uh, from the construction, right? why is that? That's just because these maps uh, C that we defined here. So there's no reason that RST had to be in the group. They could have just as easily been elements of the boundary of the group. And we can still define these infinite paths and we still get this triple point. And so we still get this bound of six times the length of w minus one. Uh, so in this case, you still, in the homogeneous situation, you see explicitly that you still get a homogeneous co-cycle that extends to the whole completion of the group and in particular, in particular uh, on the boundary of the group. And this is something I'll use uh, later. So this is just a remark I want to make. But this is extend, extends to the boundary of the group. Uh, and uh, but for Vesfina, Romberg, and Fujiwara to prove that it's non-trivial, we're going to use the inhomogeneous uh, description of this. All right, so specifically what we'll do is we'll consider, uh, consider now the corresponding uh, quasi um, 
quasi cocycle. So this is Q. And now this is just, so this is going to be our, um, what I call C here. So we're just going to take Q is mapping uh, free group to, again, L1 of this edge space. And this is going to be by Q. I'll just be explicit here and write it out. So Q of S. Uh, again, this should be, so we're going to use this function. So QS of gamma is equal to one if gamma is a subpath from, um, uh, from E to S, uh, negative one if gamma is a sub geodesic from S to E and uh, zero otherwise, um, or if gamma is not a translate of W. Right? So it's also zero if you have any, they're all translates of W and they're one if it's a sub geodesic from E to S and negative one if it's sub geodesic from S to E. All right, so this is the inhomogeneous uh, characterization. And then we get that this is a quasi cocycle. So this is just reiterating what we've already shown uh, that we have here that QS minus Q uh, TS plus T times QS. And one norm is less than or equal to six times the length of W minus one. And so in particular, also a norm two. And the proof, the theorem, uh, so this is all part of the proof. So to prove the theorem, uh, so I should remark this is again, for the same reason as before, this is unbounded. Uh, so note that Q is unbounded. So again, by finding explicit elements. So like, for instance, if W was ABAB, then again, we could just take powers of AB and we see that it's unbounded on that specific sequence of elements. Um, but now we can't uh, do Brooks's argument directly because uh, now we're dealing with uh, quasi cocycle. So here uh, I said L1 here, but we're thinking of this as mapping into L2. Um, and, and so we still get that it's a zero on, you know, if we take A, B, A, B, we still get that it's zero on powers of A and we still get that it's zero on powers of B. Uh, but then we get that the, you know, if we have a co-cycle that's bounded distance away, we get that that co-cycle is bounded on powers of A and bounded on powers of B, but you then can't conclude that it's bounded everywhere, right? Unlike the case of homomorphisms. So you have to be a little, little bit trickier, uh, but not much fortunately, that you have to say uh, first, so let's find, um, so step one to prove that it's unbounded or to prove that it's not uh, bounded. So, yeah, we'll do the same thing as before. So suppose that C mapping F2 to L2 of the edge set uh, is a cocycle. So this is a one cocycle in the usual sense, um, such that it's a bounded diff distance away from Q. So such that the norm of Q of S minus C of S on norm two is uh, less than or equal to some K, some fixed universal constant. All right, so step one now to, toward reaching a contradiction is that we will restrict the, the quasi cocycle not to some, not, not to the subgroup generated by A or the subgroup generated by B, but to some larger subgroup. Um, so step one is we'll find two subgroups 
gamma one and gamma two of the free group such that um, the quasi cocycle restricted to gamma i uh, is zero. Uh, so just like before with Brooks, so we'll find two subgroups. But the additional thing here is our subgroups. We want we can't take a and b. Uh, we'll also want and their intersection is infinite. Uh, so let me. Uh, maybe justify why you can do such a thing. So I'll give you an explicit, uh, yeah, so maybe, so for example, I'll cover most of the cases here and then I'll let you think about the remaining cases. Uh, if W is not of the form A to the N, B to the M, uh, or b to the n, a to the m, so n and m engineers. Let's suppose that it's not of this form. So then what can we do? Then you can take gamma one to be the subgroup generated by a to the p, b, and gamma two generated by a to the q, b, where, oh, that was the other thing I want to do, that the intersection is infinite and the free group, of course, is generated by closing them. Otherwise, you could take gamma one equal to gamma two. Uh, so they generate the free group. So you could take uh, gamma one to be a to the p b, gamma two to be a to the q b, where, where p and q are primes are distinct primes. Uh, so large such that uh, A to the P is larger than any occurrence of a power of A and W, uh, such that, that P and Q are larger than any occurrence of uh, powers of A and W. So if we choose this, then what do we see? We see when we write any word in gamma one, uh, it's only going to have powers of A to P that are higher, higher than any power that occurs in W. Uh, and similarly in gamma two, I will always have some power of A, which is higher than any power that occurs in W. And hence, W can't be a substring of any word in gamma one or word in gamma two, right? So we get therefore Q W restricted to gamma one is identically zero, and this is identically Q W restricted to gamma two, right? But on the other hand, the intersection of these two groups are infinite uh, because you get exactly the group generated by B is contained in the intersection. And then the other thing to notice is, of course, these two groups together generate the whole free group because you have A to the P, A to the Q, and so you get the group they generate, which contains A. Uh, so this is a situation for, that covers almost all of the words W, and then for the remaining words, I'll let you guys think, think about what happens. Uh, but then what can you do? Well, now we know that uh, this co-cycle C is a bounded distance away from Q, and Q is zero on these subgroups. So we get that therefore uh, C, so this is, I guess, step two, um, is a C restricted to uh, each gamma I is bounded. But C is a one co-cycle, and we showed earlier in the semester that bounded one co-cycles are exactly inner. So hence, there exist C1 and C2. Uh, these are in L2 of this space of edges, such that C of uh, S is equal to uh, Ci minus S Ci, 
uh, for S and gamma I. By now, we're going to use uh, the mixiness of this representation. So maybe I should have made that as a remark. So the remark is that um, the group gamma acting on L2 of the edges of the geodesics of length W. So of course, this uh, is just a multiple of the left regular representation. So this is isomorphic to some uh, infinite direct or uh, finite or infinite direct sum of the left regular representation as, left, as a as a representation. Right. This is just um, uh, because uh, gamma acts freely on the set of geodesics. So this gives us this em embedding here. Um, actually, since we fix a word, in fact, it's isomorphic to the left regular representation itself. Since we're only fixing a single word and then we're looking at all translates of this word, this gives us an explicit isomorphism uh, of this representation here into this. Well, I guess it's not correct how I've done, but uh, I should say here, you know, so this is isomorphic to a direct sum here. And in fact, the range is isomorphic to a single direct sum, is how I should say, the range of where this maps. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, this representation, the left regular representation, is a mixing representation. So that, what does that mean? That means that if we have C and eta in L2 of gamma, or even any direct sum multiple, of this. So then the matrix coefficients here, we've seen this when we talked about the Hagrow property, uh, that the matrix coefficients are C0 functions. So this goes to 0 as S goes to infinity. So these are C0 functions. Uh, how, what does that mean? Well, if we look at uh, these two co-cycles and we restrict them to uh, the intersection of these two groups, we have note that if S is in the intersection of gamma one with gamma two, so then uh, what do we get? We get that CI minus S or C1 minus S C1. This is the co-cycle of S, but this is also C2 minus S C2 because it's in both groups. But then, then we can rearrange this equation so we get that therefore C1 minus C2 is fixed by this S, S C1 minus C2. But the representation is mixing and this group is infinite, so if it's fixed, then it has to be the zero vector. And so therefore, we get that C1 is equal to C2. And this allows us to continue the Brooks argument. Uh, specifically, what we can say now is that therefore, since it's inner on gamma 1, it's inner on gamma 2 with the same vector, therefore it's inner on the group they generate. So we get the therefore, the co-cycle of S is equal to C1 or C1 minus S C1, and this is for all S in the whole group generated by gamma 1 and gamma 2. Uh, which is all of the free group. But again, this implies in particular that the co-cycle is bounded, and since Q is a bounded distance away, this implies Q is bounded. So this implies Q sub W is bounded, giving contradiction. Uh, so that finishes the proof, and like I said, as a consequence of this, uh, in particular, particular, this shows that for free groups, uh, that the bounded two cohomology of F two with values in L two of F two uh, is non-trivial.
So, uh, yeah, what I would like to do is, is now show this for all acylindrically hyperbolic groups. Uh, but to do that, which is exactly what um, Besvina, uh, Bromberg, and Fujiwara prove in their paper. But to do that, I think we'll need a little bit more um, work. For one, we haven't even defined acylindrically hyperbolic groups, so we'll have to define that. And then I'll have to show you exactly the characterization uh, I want to, to prove. Uh, but before I go, let me put a remark here. And that is that um, uh, yeah, the, re the remark is that so in particular, what Mesfina, Bromberg, and Fujiwara show is that these co-cycles are, are non-trivial, um, but they all extend continuously to the boundary, which we already showed. And the remark I'll make, and we'll use this later, so here's the remark, and this is due to uh, Mono and Shalom. And that is, uh, they showed previously, so this, uh, like, a, um, this particular fact was, I believe, originally a result for free groups was originally a result of Berger and Mano. Uh, and Mano and Shalom gave another proof of it. And what they showed is more generally that if we have alpha, I'm going to go to the homogeneous uh, perspective again. So if alpha mapping F3 to, uh, uh, actually they prove this for any uh, separable Banach space, so for any separable Hilbert space in particular. Um, so let me put H Hilbert space, H so the separable uh, Hilbert space with a unitary action. Uh, if you have that, this uh, extends continuously to a non-zero map uh, alpha mapping the boundary uh, or the, I guess the completion well the boundary I want to be non-zero on the boundary oh, that should be two uh, so then I ran out of room here. Uh, so then you get that the bounded two cohomology of F2 with the Hilbert space is non-zero. Uh, they prove this for, for many other things I, uh, besides this as, as well. Um, but the remark I want to make and, and Besvina, um, uh, yeah, they, they also prove this. Uh, Besvina, Bromberg, and Fujiwara also give a new proof of, of Mano and Shalom's result. Um, but uh, the remark I want to make is that uh, Mano and Shalom's result, proving that this is non trivial, does not actually show that this co-cycle you start with is non-trivial, uh, which is, uh, yeah, a bit, a bit unfortunate. And then that means that we're going to have to do a little bit more work to show that, to extend this result to general acylindrically hyperbolic groups. Um, because uh, in the proof that I want to show, we can't directly use the work of Besvina, Bromberg, and Pujiwara, uh, because we can't do this sort of trick like Brooks could. Uh, however, I want to go through Mono and Shalom, uh, and so we're going to have to go through their proof, which doesn't actually show that this alpha is a non-trivial co-cycle. Uh, it just shows that whenever you have a continuous extension, then there's some non-trivial cohomology here, maybe with a different co-cycle. Um, so per, for an example, which I don't actually know the proof anywhere, uh, if you consider now um, if you sum up all the Brooks co-cycles, so you consider again gamma to be F2, and now we can consider this co-cycle, 
this is the co-cycle mono and shalom really consider. So the, the co-cycle uh, homogeneous situation alpha or C S T. This time again, it's going to be uh, gamma. So C is going to map F2 squared to uh, L2 of the edge sets of length two here. So geodesics of length two. And here I'm just going to not take a specific word, but I'm going to take all words of length two. So I'm going to define this to be one if gamma is in ST, negative one if gamma is the subword of TS, sub half of TS, and zero otherwise. And then we'll set alpha to be the boundary of this C. So now when we look at the picture here, so now what we're doing is we're taking any three points and, uh, and now we're just summing the characteristic functions of all length two words here. So we get a copy. So this is our uh, S T. So then we get a copy, one copy of this word. So one copy of this word, one copy of this word. And then we get a negative of all the reverse words. Um, so this is a perfectly nice co-cycle. So it uses all, it's like summing up all of the Brooks co-cycles of, of words of length two. And, uh, and this co-cycle itself, I don't know if this is a non-trivial co-cycle or not. I don't know how to prove it. So this extends to a non-trivial co-cycle on the boundary. So we get non-trivial cohomology from mono shalom. Uh, but this co-cycle itself, I don't know if this is, uh, you know, is this a non-trivial co-cycle? Uh, and I don't know the answer to this. Uh, it certainly should be a non-trivial co-cycle, but the problem is, is that this uh, Besbina Bromberg Fujiwara proof doesn't work here because this is not this co-cycle is not zero on any infinite subgroup. Um, so that's why that's why you can't you can't find the gamma in one get one and gamma two for this for this co-cycle. So that's just a, a remark, even though it's you know it splits as a sum of um, you know, a sum of like seven or, or sum of like six Brooks co-cycles, which individually you can show are non-trivial. This co-cycle itself, I don't know. Um, okay, so that's just a remark, but we'll, we'll uh, start to get into the, the guts of Mano and Shalom's proof on Wednesday. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I don't understand why the proof about the map from F3 to L2 epsilon, uh, the length of W, leads to the conclusion that the uh, bounded cycle of uh, H2B is non zero. Uh, how this leads to, so the existence of uh, this co cycle which is not a bounded different distance away. Uh, so how does this lead to the, this conclusion that this? Yes. Yeah, that's because we showed, uh, so what does this show this, this, uh, this produces? So we get that therefore this quasi co-cycle uh, QC tilde of F2 with values in L2 of F2 is non-zero. We produce a quasi co-cycle or we've explicitly say take W, you know, take W to be ABAB. And this gives an explicit quasi cycle into L2 of F2, which we just proved in this argument is not a bounded distance away from a genuine cycle. And then in my lecture on Friday, I showed that the space of quasi co cycles that are not bounded distance away from a genuine cycle naturally embeds into H2. And that's for any group and any representation. Actually, for free groups, it'll be isomorphic, but. But, uh, uh, but because QW is function from F2 to the Hilbert space of uh, Epsilon, 
if some uh, yeah, yes, but I made the remark here, so note, so maybe I should have been more explicit. Uh, so L2, and so this, for a fixed word, for a fixed word, or W, where does the cocycle land alpha is going to map uh, gamma cubed into L2 of all geodesics of the form uh, S times W. All right, we think of W as a geodesic, so we think of E, I should say, S times E geodesic from E to W. That's where it actually maps. Okay, so what I we only consider translates of this of this path of this geodesic. So we get this path, and this is naturally isomorphic to the left regular representation by just sending this to the Dirac function of S. Okay. okay. Oh. So the component of the direct sum is only one. Yeah. If you fig if you take a fixed word, then the component of the direct sum is only one. But if the direct sum okay. were more than one, then you could also just project to one copy as well. But uh, since here, if we take a single word, uh, the direct sum is only one. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, terrific. Well, let's go ahead and stop. And uh, I have office hours if anybody has any additional questions. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.